Yeah, let's bow our heads in prayer. Because of your grace, because of your mercies, we stand here unashamed. Father God, we cannot be here, Lord, without the sacrifice that you have made on the cross on our behalf. And God, um, we fall to our knees, Lord, just knowing, Lord, uh, just what a sacrifice, Lord, that you made for us, God. And we are able to gather here on Sundays in freedom to declare your name, your beautiful name. Lord God, you are worthy of all our praise, and um, we thank you, Lord, despite all that's going on around us, God, in this world, in our hearts, Lord, in our brokenness, we fall before you, God, knowing, Lord, that you are above it all, God, that you are our solid foundation, you are steadfast, you are the rock in our lives, God. So despite what happens, Lord, despite what's going on and the circumstances around us, Lord, help us to know that you are with us and, Lord, that we may give you worship, give you praise, Lord, despite all of our circumstances. Father God, those who are hurting, those who are in pain, whether it's physical, whether it's internal, Lord, whether it's uh, troubles amongst relationships, God, Lord, we know that you have covered it all. And God, that there is an end to it all. And Lord, that we hang on to you. So Lord, um, help us, Lord, to delight in what you've already accomplished on the cross, Lord. And um, Lord, that we will continue to run this race, Lord, for you. And um, God, that we will not complicate what you have taught us, Lord, through the Bible, through your word. God, that it just really boils down, down to loving you with all our hearts, minds, and souls, and loving those around us, God. And Lord, that the gospel that you have placed in us, Lord, will be just so real that we will not be able to do anything else, Lord, but to shout it from the mountaintops as you have filled our hearts and you've filled us with love, with your mercies and your grace, God, that we may flow in an abundance for you, God, that we may go out into this world unashamed, unafraid, Lord, knowing that you are with us, Lord, that, we're, that we will completely rely on you, God. So, Lord, give us uh, courage and empowerment, Lord, not just to contain the gospel, Lord, within ourselves, Lord, but that we will go to our families, our workplaces, Lord, wherever you send us, God, that we may go. And Lord, as people uh, prepare for missions, Lord, as uh, India Missions is coming up, um, we pray, Father, that um, that people recognize, Lord, the urgency, Lord, and that people will go, people will give, and that we um, will pray and just do all that we can, Lord, for those who are still lost, Lord, still without you. And um, we pray, Father, for this church and the leadership, Lord God, that you will fill everyone with, with wisdom and give a, a new passion, Lord, for your name. And um, despite whether we may be serving you at the forefront or behind the scenes, God, that we will do so humbly. And um, Lord, that we know that the treasures will be in heaven, God. And uh, we pray for Pastor Yaz, Lord. He comes to speak, Lord. Would you anoint his heart and anoint his mind, anoint his lips, Lord, that he may speak the truth powerfully this morning. And Lord, we pray that we'll have the hearts and ears and minds to hear from you, God. So we thank you for this time together. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We can all have a seat. Uh, just great to be able to worship with all of you again this morning. Uh, I don't know how many of us were with us last week at our picnic gathering. Can we get a show of hands? Yeah, we had a great time. Uh, thank you, uh, our brother Sonny and everybody else who helped prepare and also do the cleanup. And we definitely want to have more gatherings like that where the service is not only a little shorter, 
but where we can just really share the gospel in a very plain and simple way so that we can actually invite uh, some of our friends who may never have heard the gospel or maybe they've never stepped foot in a church. So look out for more opportunities. I think the next thing that we have scheduled is definitely our Easter gathering, but we may be able to do something uh, before 2019 is over. Uh, As you can see up on the PowerPoint slide, actually, first of all, I definitely want to welcome all newcomers, visitors. We're ecstatic that you have joined us in worship, and we would love to get to know you at a more personal level uh, afterwards. Uh, During our fellowship time, we have snacks, and we would love to just not only get to know you, but enable you to get to know us as well. You might have some questions about what our church is like, uh, who we are. Uh, My name is Jason Ya, um, and yeah, I would love to get to know you at a more personal level. But anyway, like in, as you can see on the PowerPoint slide, uh, we are starting a new sermon series. It's called We Are Church. I understand grammatically it might be a little suspicious. Uh, we didn't want to say we are the church because that sounds very presumptuous as if we are the definitive church and all their churches have no value. Uh, we didn't want to say we are a church because we're not just simply a social organization. We are truly the institution that God has described in Bible, especially in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to unpack all of that throughout this sermon series. So yes, it is called We Are Church. Uh, The title of today's sermon is not from start to finish, which is the way we typically look at projects, deadlines, problems, or whatever. But in the gospel, it's actually backwards. It's actually from finish to start. What has Jesus accomplished for us? And that actually enables us to begin on this journey. Uh, So yeah, this Series is great for people who have been part of Uptown, the regulars, because it refocuses why we do the things that we do. And it's also great for newcomers and visitors, because you may be wondering what our church is about. What is this community about? Uh, I remember four years ago when I moved up to this area, man, visiting churches, it was kind of exciting. But at the same time, it was a little stressful, uh, because I didn't know what these churches were about. Some of the experiences were less than ideal. And I know for some of the visitors, newcomers here, you may be wondering, what is this church about? What is Uptown Community about? And it's really interesting because when we look at the church in Corinth, which is the letter to whom Paul is writing, man, this church, uh, they're going through some crises. Uh, It's not, it's, they're going through some difficult problems. And let's read it for ourselves. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to skip around a little bit just so that you can get the flow of the chapter a little bit better. But we're going to start with verse 10. And what Paul is writing is he's saying, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you. So immediately we see in the very first chapter, whichever church this is, the church of Corinth, there are divisions. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. But that you may be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Now, I don't know what we look for whenever we visit for a church. But if you go to a church and there is just straight up beef among its members, among the leadership. Man, you're going to wonder, I don't know if this is the right church for me. I don't even know if this is a Christian church. But this is the church that Paul is ministering to. It's interesting. Verse 12, he says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Obviously, these are rhetorical questions. Flat out, no. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. He goes on so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did, however, baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I, did not, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. He goes on, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, what is Paul talking about? The opening chapter, Paul is saying, man, I already know there is straight up beef in your leadership staff. In your congregation members, when newcomers come, when visitors come, they recognize immediately that there is tension. And you're supposed to be the church of Christ. You're supposed to be united. And if you read 1 Corinthians, how many of us have read 1 Corinthians all the way through? Okay, I wholeheartedly encourage you to do that. It's not that long of a read. And it's actually very relevant. Uh, Some of the topics are pretty controversial. And what we see about this church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 Paul talks about there is a member of this church 
who is sleeping with his father's wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see members of this church, they are filing lawsuits after one another. Just imagine, even in our church congregation, our leadership staff, we're in a lawsuit against one another. What kind of church is that? Later on, we see that whenever they do the Lord's communion, during fellowship time or during the communion, people are fighting over for more food. We see later on, during their worship services, do you know what happens? People are interrupting the worship service. Just imagine right now, somebody comes up and he steals the mic. And he says, Pastor, you step aside. Let me, let me set the people straight. And it's just absolute chaos. This is the church of Corinth. If you're a visitor of this church, you're wondering, this is an absolute gong show. What is this? And it's very encouraging for a couple of reasons. Because one of the interesting things about the Bible, if you've noticed, is God does not sweep anything under the rug. If God wanted to showcase the ideal church, he could have done that. He could have picked a really good church that's just humming along. But instead, in the Bible, God includes all of the dirt. He includes the church of Corinth with a guy sleeping with his father's wife. People following lawsuits after each other. Why? That is tremendous encouragement because many of us, if we think about our churches or even if we think about our own personal lives, man, things are not peaches and cream. Just be honest. Our life is in disarray at moments. And there's tremendous comfort because our God, just like we sang about, he is a God who seeks after the unworthy, seeks after the brokenhearted. Because there is, there is power in the gospel even for thieves. Even for people like us who are in absolute disarray. Even for the church of Corinth. Now some of us were thinking, that's great. You know, this is ancient times. How is this relevant to us? Corinth, I don't know anything. Corinth, Schmorinth, I don't know anything about Corinth. I live in Toronto. Man, this is such a progressive city. I don't know what's upside down. People are just arguing over everything. Just everything just seems so confusing. You have no idea the pressures at my work, how everybody's so ambitious. They're trying to climb the corporate ladder. You don't understand the pressures from my family, all these different things. And let me tell you, if you think Toronto is rough, you have no clue what Corinth was like. Man, Corinth will make Toronto blush. What was Corinth known for? I mean, if you don't know too much about Corinth, geographically, it was located on an isthmus which is like a strip of land that connects two bodies of land. So surrounded by water. And the reason why I bring that up is because Corinth was such a strategic city for trade, commerce, people traveling, sea, sea trade, all these different things. And because of that, Corinth was known for two things. One, wealth. Man, this city was just booming economically. Everybody's traveling to Corinth. If you want to lock down a highly financial deal, you have to go through Corinth. So a lot of rich people are coming in and out of Corinth. Man, this place is opulent, wealthy, all these things. They have all the financial income at their disposal. And the other thing that Corinth was known for was sexual promiscuity. Uh, how many of us ever heard of the term uh, of like a red light district? Red light district, it's a, it's a term nowadays, it's like a, a very um, sketchy area, usually in urban uh, areas where the prostitution is rampant. Uh, there's a lot of sex-oriented business. And um, I don't know if you've heard of like, uh, like Amsterdam, Tijuana, Bangkok, some of these really famous places that have these red light districts. Corinth, man, they, Corinth will make all those cities blush. Before there was a red light, this is the red light district of all red light districts. Man, sexual promiscuity was absolutely rampant. People were very materialistic. People were very superficial. People were very career ambitious. All these different things. And their morals, at every corner, it was tested, put to question. So when we think, well, what does this have to do with us? Man, I'm telling you, Corinth makes Toronto blush. And this is what Paul is talking about. And this, these are Christians living in such a secular city. And what's interesting is, just imagine you're Paul. And you're the guy 
blood, sweat, and tears, you founded this church. You risked your life. You've been flogged, all these different things. You founded this church. You love this church. You poured out your heart and soul. All of these guys love you. And then you go out and plant other churches. And then all of a sudden, you hear reports from Chloe's family, just like the verse that we read. Paul, I hope you're doing well. But uh, I got some bad news. Man, people are fighting tooth and nail. People are competing. People are trying to grab the greatest piece of bread during communion. People are putting each other down. There is even a guy sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul's thinking, man, I founded this church. I prayed. I fasted for this church. How does Paul respond? How do you think Paul responds? It's amazing. Because in Paul's letter, yes, he is firm. Yes, he is strong. But there is not a hint of discouragement. There is not a hint of Paul being angry. Instead, let's take a look at the way he writes. So let's continue on in 1 Corinthians. And now we're going to go all the way to the first verses of the letter. This is how Paul starts. Even though this church is in disarray, Paul says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He says, I know about your disarray. I know about these things that even the pagan neighbors, they would say, I can't believe you're sleeping with your father's wife. But Paul does not hesitate. He says, you are the church of God. And not only that, he says, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, I know not everybody grew up in the church. So the word sanctified might be, what is this? Is he talking about like dishwashers? or What is this? Is he like a germaphobe? Sanctified is such an important word in the gospel. Sanctified means that when Jesus died on that cross, when he saved us from our sins, he wiped the slate clean. And that's why we can sing about how thieves will recognize the holiness of God. Yes, he has done that. God has forgiven all of our sins. It doesn't matter. But that's not the end of the gospel. What happens next is a word called sanctification. And what that means is if Jesus has died for us and we submit to his lordship, he promises us that he will sanctify us. And what it means that we are sanctified is that we are going to be made holy. We are going to be made just like Jesus Christ himself. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. It doesn't matter how addicted you are to whatever kind of sins. It doesn't matter how chaotic your life is. Sanctification is signed, sealed, delivered. You take that thing to the bank. And what's interesting is all of the biblical writers, other than this verse, whenever they talk about sanctification, they always say, you will be sanctified. Or you are being sanctified. It's always a future hope, something that has not yet been fully accomplished. Paul here, to the church of Corinth, to the church where all this chaos, all this sexual promiscuity, all these different things, disarray, following lawsuits after one another, he says, it's not enough that you will be sanctified. You can take that to the bank, but Paul says, you have been sanctified. Yes, I hear all the reports that Chloe's family told me. I know about all the shame and the guilt. But guess what the gospel says about all of that? It's you have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he doesn't say, oh, you will be sanctified. He doesn't say, oh, I can't wait until he is able to be disciplined so that he can get over this. No, he says, you have been sanctified. The blood of Jesus covers over all of us. And that is so effective. When God sees us, he sees us not as sinners, even though rightfully we are. He sees us as saints. He sees us as holy. Wow. And Paul doesn't say we need to start from start to finish. We need to start from finish to start. We need to start with what Jesus has done, what he has accomplished, and let's go from there. 
Because if we start with ourselves, I'm telling you, we will all be like deer in the headlights, paralyzed, unable to do anything with our sin. Paul says, no, 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 you have been sanctified. You are saints. And that's why he continues, man, there is no discouragement, there's no nothing. Grace to you, peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you. He doesn't say, I thank God sometimes when you're doing well, when you do your quiet times, when you serve, when you go on that mission. He said, always, I thank God for you. Why? He spells it out. Because, not because of who you are. Not because of your potential. Not because of your inner beauty or whatever the society is going to try to preach at you. He says, not because of you. Because the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Furthermore, that in every way you are enriched, we'll skip that, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. The reason why I'm highlighting the things that I highlighted is because the reason why Paul is so thankful, so overjoyed, even though this church of Corinth is in disarray, is not because they have potential. It's not because they have this inner beauty that they just need to understand this person's heart. It's none of those things. If anything, they're the problem. Paul says the reason why I have joy and hope is because of who God is. Because of the grace of God. Because God is faithful. Because he will sustain you. Because he will make you guiltless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, as a pastor here, I know I haven't been too, here been too long. Uh, maybe a year and a few months. I'm so thankful for our uptown community. And yeah, I, I, uh, even at our leadership discipleship retreat, I said, hey, like, I'm so thankful. I, I noticed the things that you guys do behind the scenes. Humbling. Very blessed. But I say, when I pray for you guys, and when I pray for this congregation in general, my heart is filled with joy, hope, just so much confidence. Not because of you. Don't take that personally. I'm just using Paul's words. Because, man, our lives are messed up. We don't have to front. My confidence is the fact that our God is a faithful promise keeper. What he says will happen. When he says that we have been sanctified, boom, case closed. Our hope when we pray for each other, when you pray for your kids, your spouse, whatever, when you pray for fellow brothers and sisters, when you pray for this community, is not in us. But it's simply in who God is and how he relates with us. That's it. If we shift our focus to anything else, man, that's going to be tough. It's going to be impossible. So Paul is overjoyed. Even though Corinth is in disarray, he says, I know my God. When he died for you, his blood is so effective. Nothing can reverse that. I know my God will be faithful for you. There's a second reason why God, or I'm sorry, Paul is overjoyed. And that is going to take us to the remaining verses of our passage. And the second reason, let me just give you a preview, a TLDL, too long didn't listen version, is, all right, it sounds very simple, but man, it is immensely profound. When we think about our weaknesses, our sin, our guilt, our shame, our rebellion, so on and so forth. According to Paul, it's not that God puts up with our weaknesses. It's not like God begrudgingly says, oh man, there we go again, Jason messing things up. But you know what? I made that promise, so I guess I have to fulfill it. That's not the way God is, at least according to these verses. According to these verses, the TLDL is God intentionally chooses the weak, the foolish, the rebellious, in order for him to be that much more glorified. Sounds simple, but man, it is immensely profound. So let's take a look at this. So Paul says, for the word of the cross is folly, is foolishness 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, this is God saying, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. This is what God is saying. And one thing that I really want to emphasize is that when Paul talks about our weakness, he says, do you know why Jesus died on a cross? Of all the things, why did Jesus die on a cross? And in other sermons and other passages I mentioned, the reason why Jesus died on the cross is because that is the most horrific way of dying. And that just shows God's anger against sin. That's true. But in these verses, Paul gives another reason. The reason why Jesus dies on a cross is to show that God wants to use the foolish and the weak things of this world. I know for many of us in the 21st century, man, cross is like, is an emblem of Maybe even prestige of a value. I mean, you see hip-hop artists, celebrities, athletes, they're wearing cross after they celebrate a goal or a touchdown, they do the cross motion. So it's, it's, it kind of lo- this verse kind of loses its effect in modern 21st century. Um, so I was looking up just uh, over the retreat, just the most horrific and humiliating executions. And man, there are some really wild executions. Um, I don't recommend you do th- to search that. But, man, there are some situations where, um, oh man, rat torture. I don't know. Some guy is bound up like this, and they just unleash, like, like hungry, famished rats. And the rats, they just go at his, his skin, and then he basically just dies of pain and just blood loss. These are executions that have taken place in various societies. Um, There are flaying where you skin the person a lot. I mean, there are just the most humiliating, most grotesque. And why am I sharing these things with you? I know some of us are a little sensitive. The reason why I'm sharing these things is because when we think about the cross, or I'm sorry, not when we, but when Paul's hearers, ancient societies, when they hear about the cross, they think about not just the nice jewelry. They think about rat torture. They think about somebody being flayed, skinned a lot. They're thinking, oh, cross That's only for the worst criminals. Why would a God, you're telling me that if this God loves us, he is subjecting himself to a cross? Only criminals die on a cross. Don't you recognize that? And a lot of people are wondering, you know what, I understand your gospel. That's great. God is loving. But one thing I cannot get over is the idea that a God would die by rat torture. It just doesn't make any sense. Just, Paul, you're full of it. And that's why he says, it is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the expression of God's power. Do you know what it was like for Jesus to hang on that cross? I don't know if the nails were through his wrists or through his hands. We don't know historically because there are different variations. But his hands or wrists were nailed to a cross, a wooden beam. His feet were nailed to a cross, a wooden beam that's vertical, the shape of a cross. And the way most people die on the cross is due to suffocation. Just imagine, Jesus, we know in the gospel accounts, he was flogged on his back. His skins, his entrails, his organs were probably just exposed, his back. And every time he is gasping for breath, man, he's hanging. And he needs to scrape his back against that cross. And imagine, I mean, it's not like a well-sanded wooden beam. It is like splinters everywhere. It is digging into his flesh. And every time his muscles are numb, and every minute or so he is just gasping for one breath at a time, and he's probably dying of either blood loss or just suffocation. And the reason why it's a cross, it is it is. upright, it is elevated, so all of the village, all of the societies know That when they see criminals on that cross and they are just barely breathing, blood, naked, all the the most humiliating death, they recognize, man, that person deserves it. I'm not going to mess with the Roman government. God intentionally chose that instrument in order to show that God desires to seek and use what is foolish and what is weak. He doesn't do it begrudgingly. He intentionally seeks after the weak and the foolish. The foolish, the weak instrument of the cross. God says, you know what I'm going to do with that? 
I'm going to make that the expression of my power and glory. Let's continue. And why does that relate with us? So where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? That's exactly what he's doing. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God. God chooses it this way. Through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Paul continues, for Jews demand a sign, demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, like I mentioned, people can't get over it, to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those of us who are being called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose. Get that? He, he didn't just accidentally do this. He chose what is foolish in the world. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring nothing to nothing, things that are, so that, and whenever you see so that in the Bible, highlight that, because it means this is a reason behind everything. Why does God choose the weak and the foolish? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. What does this all have to do with us? Uh, so I've been in the ministry for, I guess, over 20 years at this point, ever since I was in high school. And uh, I've seen a lot of people really have a passion for Jesus and they want to serve. Um, but I also see a lot of people, they have a passion for Jesus, but they don't want to serve. Because they feel like, I love Jesus, but how can God use me? I'm weak. I'm foolish. My commitment is very fickle. My love grows cold. I go up and down. You don't know, my, my life is a roller coaster. And you know what's so funny is according to these verses, isn't that the job description? Like all of us, I mean, how many of us have applied for a job before or looked at a job description? Uh, pretty much everybody. And when you look at a job description, qualifications, education, program in this degree, all these different things, five years of experience, these things prefer, all these different things. And have you ever seen a job description and you're like, that is me. And you are so excited, you feel like you are the perfect shoe and fit. You know what God's job description is to be a disciple, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus? It's not years of experience. It's not how many baptisms have you conducted. It is, are you weak? Are you foolish? Are you broken? That's it. God intentionally chooses those who are weak and full. These are not my words. These are the we're reading this from 1 Corinthians 1. Why? So that when God does one miracle after another through your life, when people are being transformed through your life, God will do those things. Everybody would say, All glory to God. I know your life is messed up. You opened up to me. I know you still struggle with these things. But you know what? Something about the way you seek after God resonates with me and gives me a greater desire to seek after him. All I can say is, you're, it's not that you're great. We have a great God. And what God wants to do with every single one of us is, yes, we have disarray. We have chaos in our lives. Jesus says, bring it on. I paid for that. I died for that. And I will use that to edify others. Other people can be loved, can experience the gospel, and that is how our God receives glory. I'm going to ask the band to come forward as we close our time. Um, and as they come forward, if we can all rise and just really reflect upon some of the things that the Holy Spirit might be saying through 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, as you notice, uh, although the theme of this sermon series is we are church, you're going to quickly recognize, man, this life is not about us. It's not about who we are. It's all about who God is. 
and just how amazing he is, how loving, how he surprises us, overwhelms us with his grace. Um, I know this sermon might have been all over the place, so let me just kind of recap. Just like the church of Corinth, all of us, we don't need to front. Our life is filled with sin, shame, guilt, chaos, disarray, whatever. You might be going through a good season right now, and that's great. Praise God. It's just around the corner where God exposes. There's a little bit more. There's a little bit more that I need to sanctify. And the message that Paul has thousands of years ago is the same message that the Holy Spirit wants to impress upon your heart. All that disarray, all that chaos, guess what it has been paid for? Do you know how precious, how powerful, how effective, how irreversible is the blood of Jesus Christ? That despite your sin, despite your past, despite your current state, despite your future, His blood triumphs over all those things. So that when God looks at you, He doesn't just put up with you. He says, you have been sanctified. You are a saint. I love you. I am so proud over you. Don't look at yourself. Look to me. Look to the God who is faithful to one person at a time. His track record is perfect, unblemished. He will be true to you if we trust in him. And not only that, Paul goes on and says, it's not that you're just weak and foolish. God intentionally seeks after the weak and foolish. He chooses it that way. That is the job description. So that in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of our messed up lives, the whole world will know, just as we sang, we will shout it from the mountaintops, not who we are, but who is God, that he would take messed up lives like mine, messed up lives like yours, redeem it, and use it to express his glory. The same way that he used the cross, the folly of this world, to express his glory, he will use us, the foolishness of this society, to express his glory and wisdom. So I want to give us an opportunity. I don't know what part of that really resonates with you, but let's pray. If you don't believe, ask the Holy Spirit, help me to believe. I want to believe in these words, but if you look at my situation, it's so hard. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. If you've been running on your own strengths, maybe you need to repent and ask God, God, humble me. Help me to be a broken, contrite vessel. So I just want to give us an opportunity to just pray, respond to the Holy Spirit uh, before the band uh, leads us into a song.